you know, the thing about having a conversation like this locally that's different than when I leave town and have conversations like this is it invites in more of, more of our community and more of the stories of how I'm actually involved in so many different cross-cutting issues. And I, and I think that really gets to the heart of, uh, you know, what does it look like to start practicing this stuff, to start winning? It's much more comprehensive. Um, so yeah, just flipping just that hat, that angle on, on my role, organizing the worker co-op movement, um, particularly here in the US, and, and how that connects um, to these, this broader political project. Uh, I think you're right in a sense, but I think one of the things that's shifting is that the moment when, when cooperative generally and, and worker co-ops kind of as part of that were seen as a primarily white thing, coincided with um, kind of an aberration historically. It was just one moment where it was seen as an alternative, a way to opt out of the traditional economy. And what's shifting is that now it's seen as a way to opt in for people who've been shut out, locked out, marginalized in various ways, including people with criminal records, people um, who don't have documentation and papers to work. Um, otherwise, that, that, that work cooperatives are, are now being used and, and iterated on in a, in a diversity of different strategies of how we formulate um, business formations that are worker-owned in order to get access to um, either a new type of market or for, for people who, uh, whether they're doing domestic work, home cleaning, um, and even stuff related to, to the, the new kind of energy democracy, uh, renewable, sustainable, green um, jobs and businesses that, that, are, that are part of uh, what was left out in how traditional capitalist industries have um, branched out economically, right? And so there's gaps in that market. The spaces of innovations are more around um, people in worker cooperative spaces. Part of the idea is that when labor actually not just seizes um, control adversarially against um, management or against owners, but actually seizes the means of production, seizes the apparatus of management inside of their workplaces, then it's a whole different calculus, right? And so it's not just about what is a sort of way to gamify and get access to, uh, to gainful jobs or employment, um, but also we're talking about how worker ownership is one of the primary ways for communities of color to build assets in the 21st century economy. That it, it addresses a, a, an increasing racialized wealth gap, that it's one of the primary ways that, um, that especially black people, but for communities of color to be able to gain an asset in a, in a market that is shut out, gentrifying, displacing communities of color from home ownership, which traditionally was the primary way of getting access to, to wealth building or to an asset um, in the economy. So that, that is, that is um, kind of to your earlier point, a return, right? That, that cooperation, whether it was through lending and susus, whether it was through a long and deep history um, of communities of color practicing, owning and controlling their own businesses, um, that were returning and reclaiming those practices, which in fact were uh, erased by mostly white professionals, by, by histories that were told, um, by academics, by, um, by cooperative leaders um, throughout sort of the middle of the 20th century. Um, and, and partially that was an erasure that had to do with the divide and conquer racial, again, racial capitalism in that moment, the 20th century, as a way of dividing and conquering people said, well, you know what? This, you can't, you can't fight for racial, racial justice and civil rights at the same time that you're also fighting for these economic rights. And so um, there, was a, there was a tacit um, strategy, survival strategy among black organizers um, in the US to start keeping quiet about all of the, the deep history of solidarity, economic organizing and practice that, that had been happening in our country. So everyone that you know about from organizing civil rights stuff, from Fannie Lou Hamer um, to Ella Baker, uh, Philip Randolph, all of them were organizing worker-owned cooperatives throughout the early 20th century. And that was suppressed because black people couldn't possibly face the twin attacks of McCarthyism um, and all the attacks that were happening around socialist practices and institutions 
while simultaneously facing the Klan and facing um, anti-black racism and an attack on civil rights. And so that absolutely was part of our history that we're just starting to now reclaim and retell. Um, and, and thankfully, we're, we're lucky to be organizing as a grassroots um, membership-based organization in the cases of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, where all of our leaders um, are black, brown, immigrants, um, people of color. Two-thirds of our board uh, are actually Spanish-speaking, um, and a lot of our staff, all of our staff directors are people of color. Many of us come from immigrant back backgrounds, like myself. Um, also first generation, my family's also from the Caribbean. <laughs> um, and so this is the new face of, um, of this organizing. Um, the, definitely the growing edge of how um, we're seeing the, the economic response to um, democratic socialism and to linking and solidarity with movements around the world, around what it looks like during this particular moment of um, pushing back against right-wing populism with a left-wing response to that.